Okay. I uh, want to welcome you all to the MIDAS seminar for today. Uh, and this is also a distinguished lecture for computer science and engineering. Uh, and we are privileged to have Professor Juliana Freire from the from New York University here today with us. Uh, Professor Freire was uh, uh, has been, I guess, uh, holder of of uh, many prestigious positions. She was on the CCC. She was the president of ACM Sigmod, which is the primary organization representing uh, data management research. Uh, she has uh, been the recipient of a number of uh, awards, including the Sigmod Contributions Award. Uh, and uh, I guess any number of awards from foundations uh, and and industrial sponsors, too many to mention. Uh, she has been uh, a PI of one of the major Moore Sloan data science awards. Um, there were only three of these in the that kind of launched data science as a discipline. Uh, across uh, the U.S. and uh, and so she has really a lot to tell us, and I'm really looking forward to her talk today. Thank you, Juliana. Thanks, Jack, for the invitation. Thank you for coming uh, in person. This is uh, the first time that I'm I'm talking in person since uh, you know the pandemic be began. So I'm really happy to be here, and uh, thank you for coming. Um, Well, let's do the hybrid mode. Go All right, thank you. So, so Jack gave a very, uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. You know, it's very kind what you said, um, but my work does, uh, has always been in this intersection between computer science and data science in the sense that uh, most of the problems that I work on are motivated by real problems that people face when they have to interact with data, right? And, uh, you know, I'm very fortunate that, uh, you know, much of my research has happened in this era where data-driven exploration has exploded. And it has impacted our society in many different ways, right? So if you look at science, it has led to great advances and it has also transformed how we do science. So we went from this, you know, hypothesis testing to using data to generate new hypotheses. And this is uh, what Jim Gray and his colleagues termed as the fourth paradigm of science. Um, you see companies, they uh, are capitalizing on data, you know, some companies, they make money off data and data has been termed by some as the new oil. And if you look at government, increasingly they're using data to uh, improve their operations uh, and inform uh, their decisions and policies uh, that they design, right? And this has been enabled, this perfect storm has been enabled by this, uh, you know, this revolution in that computing is free, storage is essentially free and you have lots of data. And the problem that we have right now is that the bottlenecks that we have to discovery lies um, primarily with people, right? And what is difficult in doing data-driven exploration? People now must manage, uh, ingest, clean, integrate, analyze, uh, create predictive models, right? From these vast amounts of data that come from different sources and have different levels of uh, quality or noise, if you will. And uh, 
to generate insights from these data, you need to assemble these very complex computational processes that require knowledge in many different fields and disciplines from math and statistics to different sub areas of uh, computer science. Uh, and this problem is, uh, is, is it, this makes it very difficult for domain experts that do not have training in computing, that don't know all these tools and computer science uh, methods to actually explore their data. And as a result, they have to depend on data scientists uh, to do the analysis for them. Not only does this distance them from their data, it also prevents them from actually exploring the data and generating new hypotheses. Uh, this problem is compounded by the fact that when you're doing data exploration, this requires an inherently iterative process where you, know, you get some data, you do some computation, you look at the results, you come up with new questions, uh, with new ideas, you change your computation and you keep doing this over and over again until you have your aha moment, you answer your questions or you find you know, the cool question to answer. The challenge here is that in this iterative process, after many steps that you go through, it's very easy to get to a nice result and not remember how you got there, right? And there's lots of opportunities for you to be wrong, for the computations that you did to be wrong, right? For the data that you use to be wrong, right? The problem is that, you know, in this um, tortuous path from data to knowledge, which finally get to decisions, right? Bad things can happen. And because nowadays more and more we're making decisions based on data and computations, um, this can have uh, serious consequences, right? wrong decision, the wrong conclusions, bad decisions, right? So my research over the past, I'm gonna date myself many years, uh, has been that the overarching goal has been to empower a wide range of users to explore data and obtain trustworthy, actionable insights from data, right? Uh, and I'm very fortunate to be part of the NYU Visualization Image and Data Analysis Center, VIDA, where I have a number of partners in crime that share with me a passion, uh, this passion for data and data exploration, but work in different areas and no methods different from the ones that uh, are in you know, my uh, area of research data management. So over time, we've actually been able to combine methods from different computer science areas to solve real problems. And I'm gonna talk about some, some of these today, right? Uh, and uh, you know, we, we work on a wide range of problems at the different points of the data life cycle from data discovery, curation, analysis and visualization, modeling. Um, and uh, we often not only publish papers, come up with algorithms that we build systems and deploy these systems uh, to real users. And if you wanna get a, a sense of what we do, you can just visit our uh, GitHub rep. So today I chose to talk about uh, two of the key aspects that I see or key challenges that I see in data-driven exploration. One is the need uh, to make it accessible to a lot of people, to a wide range of, of users, domain experts, right? And that involves the challenges of you know, having usability. But on the flip side, this usability also requires performance. And I'm gonna talk about how you can actually combine techniques of computer graphics, data management, and visualization to actually come up with good solutions to one specific problem in this area. And the other one is uh, reproducibility and trust. If we make this widely available and lots of people are using data and deriving insights, how can we actually assist people to build trust in their results and ascertain whether their conclusions are actually correct? All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about provenance and reproducibility and how can you, use, you can use that to enable debugging and trust, uh, building, and building trust on your results. So let me start with usability and performance. And uh, as a concrete example of both the opportunities and challenges of data-driven exploration, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about urban data. Uh, and this is an application area that I've been working since I joined NYU about 10 years ago, right? Uh, and urban data is, uh, um, is growing and it also offers a number of opportunities, right? Why? Because um, if you look at the cities, they are the center of economic activity. Most of the population in the world already lives in cities, and this number is growing. It's slated to grow to 70% by 2050. Uh, you live in beautiful Ann Arbor, but if you live in New York City like I do, you, you're, you're going to see 
all the problems that this uh, growth in cities uh, leads to, including transportation, pollution, um, uh, housing, cost of housing, uh, and aging infrastructure. The good news is that there's been a huge push to capture data about urban environments. Not only that, there's been a push to open up this data and we see large volumes of data collected by many cities around the world, New York, London, Paris, you name it. And people are collecting data about different um, aspects or different components of urban environments, including the infrastructure, environment, and the people, the residents, uh, the people that live in these cities, right? So the question is, can we use this data exhaust to uh, crack the code of cities, right? And use it to understand how these different components interact over space and time and use these uh, insights to make cities more efficient, sustainable, as well as you know, make the lives of the residents better. So we've been working on this problem. And uh, you know, before I talk about what we, we are doing, let me show you um, a quick video of a system that was developed in my group in collaboration with architects from KPF, where they're trying to understand different um, uh, uh, indicators or uh, uh, characteristics of the city, crime, uh, access to subway and so on, to try and figure and answer qu important questions for them, like where to start a new development, uh, how to price different units, or how a particular building is going to affect uh, the urban environment. Right? So let me just play quickly. Urbane allows users to seamlessly explore the city based on multiple 2D and 3D data layers. For example, noise, crime, and is visualized here, subway access. The data can be explored at different resolutions, the city, neighborhoods, and buildings. The opacity of the 3D buildings can be controlled for better visualization of the data layers. Urbane uses a parallel coordinate chart that allows for easy and intuitive filtering of urban data sets. Here, we filter neighborhoods for various attributes, such as subway access and noise. The bold blue line represents the average of all midtown neighborhoods. The bold red line is a user-selected neighborhood here at the financial district. Filtering of various attributes allows users to understand the characteristics of Manhattan neighborhoods. For example, the financial district and Midtown are very similar across most attributes. At the neighborhood scale, the same filtering system is applied to individual buildings. Again, the blue line represents the Manhattan average. Here, we filter individual buildings for attributes such as built area, crime, and noise, identifying sites for potential development. Once specific sites have been identified, Urbane gives users the ability to replace existing buildings with new buildings, testing different tower sizes and program combinations for the maximum zoned floor area. The user can generate speculative buildings on many sites. Here we see a hotel with residential, an all residential building, and an office with residential. Once buildings are generated, Urbane can compute derived 3D attributes from the data in building. This includes the view from buildings to selected landmarks, the impact of buildings on sky exposure at the street level, and the impact of the buildings on the views of the existing context. This analysis can be used to evaluate the trade-offs between the value of a new development and its impact on the character of the neighborhood. This can facilitate the design and development process between architects, developers, and city planners. All right, so I think you, you, you get a sense. Uh, and what we, are, we tried to achieve with Urbane was um, First, usability. We wanted the architects to be able to do this kind of exploration very easily. And we did that through uh, having, providing visual queries. So one novel feature of Urbane is that I think it's the first system that actually views uh, or treats cities as three-dimensional environments, right? And you've seen in the video that uh, you can pose queries like view impact. If you build something, what views from other buildings are gonna be, uh, um, um, affected, right, as well as sky exposure, right, because, you know, in cities like in New York, the more buildings you have, the less sunlight you get in, in the neighborhood, right. Uh, as you also saw, the system also supports these visual 2D queries, which are traditional analytics queries, like, for example, you have these um, um, uh, heat maps, and this one is showing uh, taxi pickup density in New York City. So you see there's more taxis in Midtown, right? And we also saw that uh, you can use these parallel coordinates to uh, understand characteristics of different indicators and compare different neighborhoods, right? So 
these queries, they are done visually, but in the back end, they're actually, uh, you, you can pose them as SQL queries over a back end database that uh, stores the data about taxis, crime, noise, and so on and so forth, right? So these are, you know, spatial aggregation queries that tell me, uh, in this case, the density of taxis in each neighborhood. Uh, and here in the parallel coordinate, it's the same kind of query as also spatial aggregation, but we're actually looking at doing that over multiple data sets, right? Food, noise, and so on, right? And the challenge here is that, yes, this is easy to use. The architects love it. But how do you actually attain interactivity? Because interactivity, when you're doing data exploration, uh, is key, right? If you have high latency, maybe like even, even uh, latencies of 500 milliseconds, uh, it has been shown by Liu and here that this uh, increased latency reduces the rate at which users make observations, draw gener generalizations and generate hypotheses. So the question is, how can we actually support the, these uh, queries? And in the case of Urbane, one uh, additional challenge is that we have a very high query rate. As the users are interacting with uh, you know, uh, these data, uh, a large number of these spatial aggregation queries uh, are actually issued to the backend, right? And when we started, we tried to use, you know, traditional relational databases. And here's a, a plan that is generated by a commercial database system for this particular query here, right? Doing the uh, spatial aggregation over neighborhoods in New York. And these queries are uh, notoriously expensive to evaluate because you have neighborhoods, you have taxis. So you need to first do a join between taxis and the neighborhood polygons, right? And you do that in an approximate way. Uh, you use, you know, because the neighborhoods are complex polygons with lots of different uh, sides. Um, you do first an approximation by a minimum bounding rectangle, and then you have to refine just the taxis that are inside the, the neighborhood polygon. And this is what is called a pointing polygon task, which can be very expensive and the complexity is uh, uh, proportional to the number of sides of the polygon, right? So this, just in summary, this is very expensive. Then the results of the join need to be uh, materialized and then you need to compute the aggregation, right? So very expensive. And if you try to run this, it takes several minutes on a commercial database on a large, in, on a large server, right? And when you saw the video for Urbane, you saw that it was much faster than this. So how did we do this magic? Uh, the magic came from um, taking a fundamentally different approach to performing these joins, right? So instead of thinking in the database way, we looked at spatial aggregation through a geomet geometric perspective, from a geometric point of view. So here, instead of thinking about joins between tables or points and polygons represented as tables, uh, we actually model this operation as drawing, right? So you guys are familiar with GPUs. Uh, GPUs are really good at drawing. They do that for games and so on. They're very fast. And you can actually use them to do this kind of database operations too. So how do you do spatial aggregation? You get the GPU uh, um, the screen, the, the virtual screen in the GPU, you draw your input points, then you can draw your input polygons, and then you rasterize it. So you actually look at the intersection between the polygons and the points, right? So what happens here is that we can leverage this GPU uh, and the speed of the GPU to perform these drawing operations really, really fast, right? And this is a good example of uh, working in an interdisciplinary environment. If I had a group of just database people, that insight would never come. But I actually collaborated with Harish Swami, who's an expert in computer graphics uh, and knows a lot about GPUs, and he had this insight. And then I'm going to show you how big a difference this makes, right? So, so this is a kind of like an idea behind it. Uh, you have, like, say, your taxi trips. You draw them on the GPU screen, and you keep aggregating as you find points in the you know, pixels of the screen, right? Um, but the idea here is that we can, again, exploit the native support uh, for drawing the GPUs. Um, another big advantage here is that now you no longer have join and aggregation done separately. You can compute both in a single step. 
and you no longer have to do these point and polygon tasks that are very expensive. Uh, there are some caveats. Uh, if you know computer graphics, when you do rasterization, you can get false positives and false negatives, but we address that by coming up with uh, you know, a, a, bounded, a bounded version a version of our algorithm that uh, you can actually specify the error bound that is acceptable for your application. And we also have a, a version of the algorithm that is slightly more expensive, but that produces accurate results. But I should preface that by saying that uh, for most of the applications that use visualization like Urbane, the approximate results actually work really well in practice. So that's uh, you know, an interesting idea, but how well does it work in practice? So we ran experiments um, where we used uh, a laptop equipped with a GPU uh, and uh, we tried the query uh, over the New York City taxi data with uh, almost 900 million points and doing spatial aggregation over 260 New York City neighborhoods, right? So this query takes you know, tens, uh, 20, 30 minutes in a relational database, right? Uh, but using this approach, uh, it's much faster. So just to give uh, as a point of comparison, uh, the performance that we achieve with the raster join compared to a baseline CPU implementation is about 300 times faster, right? And more concretely, if you look at the actual running time uh, for an input size of almost 900 million points, um, it takes uh, just a little bit over one second, right? Which is, you know, quasi interactive times here. Okay. So simple idea works really well in practice, right? Um, uh, but then these GPUs are very powerful. They can lead to great results, but writing the code for GPUs is very difficult. And what we notice over time in our group is that yes, uh, they can work very well in practice, and we've actually used GPUs uh, for accelerating um, a number of queries in different projects, including in the TaxiVis project, um, where we also, you know, like Urbane, we developed this visual query interface. And when we tried to use databases, existing systems it was really slow. We developed an index based, uh, a GPU powered index, and we got kind of like speed ups between, you know, 274 and 6,000, you know, compared to commercial databases and Postgres. Uh, so the question is, uh, you know, can we make GPU works work for all kinds of spatial databases, right? Uh, and for that, uh, you know, we use the insight we got from raster join um, in that, you know, can we actually uh, design these spatial operators using basic GPU operations uh, for drawing, just like what we did for uh, raster drawing, right? So um, again, Harish had this idea that, okay, why don't I just, just like you have relational algebra, can we um, uh, design a spatial algebra? And he, uh, he came up with this idea of a data model, which we call Canvas, that uh, provides a uniform representation for different kinds of geometric objects. He also designed uh, uh, an algebra that um, abstracts uh, low level operations in the GPU, right? And uh, these operators are gonna operate over the geometric objects. And he implemented all of this using the graphic pipelines that is supported by all different GPU uh, um, hardware, right? And this is what it looks like. So the idea is that, that you can build implementations of different spatial queries like selection of origin destination data or selection with multiple polygonal constraints or even raster join, but just combining, mixing and matching the uh, algebra operators. So you can uh, do these implementations without any need to write GPU codes. You only write GPU codes for the actual operators, okay? So again, this is very nice. Uh, and I'm not gonna you know, get into a lot of details about the experimental evaluation. But we're just trying to get a sense of uh, how useful or how efficient this can be in practice. And uh, the challenge here was that there are no other systems that use GPUs to answer or, uh, or to uh, evaluate these spatial queries. So we try to find other systems that were able to handle the scale of the data that we do. And the systems that uh, fit the bill are cluster-based systems. And we use uh, GeoSpark that runs on big clusters. Uh, 
and S2, which is a library developed by Google that requires very large memory. And uh, you know, to our surprise, um, running on a laptop, the implementation of the, of the algebra was many times faster than both systems, including GeoSpark, running on a cluster with 17 nodes. Right? So what we see here is uh, you know, a great promise to democratize large scale spatial data analysis, uh, having the ability to run or analyze this data on commodity machines, right? Given that GPUs are available in all laptops and cheap desktops, right? So this is kind of like an, an example where, uh, you know, we work towards democratizing data exploration. And there's been a lot of work and I'm very happy to see in data management in visualization conferences, people that are working towards that goal. Uh, I think that there has been much less emphasis on uh, building trust in the insights that you derive from data exploration, right? And this is particularly important when you have so many people doing these analysis and increasingly these, the results of these analysis being used uh, to um, make decisions, right? So, um, but for the second part, I'd like to talk more about, you know, what do we need and what the challenges are to attain trust in the results of computations, right? Uh, but before I do that, I'd like to digress uh, a bit and talk about reproducibility and replicability. Because if you think about it, achieving trust in a particular result is something that is the basis of science or the scientific method, right? You have some hypothesis, you try to uh, you know, figure out is it true or false, and you design a bunch of experiments to figure out whether uh, you know, that's really a good scientific result, right? And uh, in science, when we talk about um, um, building trust, it's essential to be able to repeat an, an experiment. So it's, uh, it's crucial to describe an experiment in sufficient detail so that others can actually repeat it. Um, one issue though, is that uh, when people talk about repeating experiments, uh, there's this, uh, they use these two terms, reproducibility and replicability. And although they're synonymous in English, when you talk about, uh, that, when you use them in the context of scientific experiments, people use them inconsistently to mean different things, right? So for the rest of the talk, I just like to, you know, settle on the, these definitions. Uh, and uh, this is what we came up with uh, after 18 months working on this uh, report for the National Academies. Uh, and it was, it's a very controversial. People are still not happy with these definitions, even people that participated in coming up with them. So we define replicability as uh, if you give an experiment and you, you can replicate it, you're gonna obtain consistent measures or results um, by uh, using new data, new methods or conditions uh, in a study that aimed at the same or similar scientific method, right? So here's your, your, your repeating the experiment, but you're, you're varying some of the conditions of the experiment, right? And then you have reproducibility, which uh, was defined as being synonymous with computation reproducibility, where it's uh, more like exact reproduction, which is obtaining consistent computation results using the same input data, uh, computation steps, environment methods, and conditions of analysis. And uh, if you think about these, uh, you know, Replicability would apply to um, wet labs, to uh, people designing uh, drugs, right? To physics experiments where they're taking measurements and so on. That is really hard to control the environment and uh, you know have ex exact reproduction. Whereas reproducibility happens in computers, right? Um, and in theory, it should be easier because it happens in a controlled environment, right? Um, However, uh, the devil is in the details because yes, computers are controlled environments, but they are complex environments. And uh, both in computing and in software development, a uh, very powerful tool that we use is this notion of abstraction, right? Because that's how we conquer complexity. We have uh, you know, our hardware that is very complex, but then we abstract away the complexity of the hardware using operating systems. 
Uh, we abstract that away through programming languages, and then we encapsulate some useful features in libraries that make it much easier to build applications on top of that, right? Uh, each layer builds on the next. Uh, the problem is that this adds complexities when there are unforeseen interactions um, across these different layers. Let me give you uh, a few examples of uh, you know, when this happened. So there are some, this article on Ars Technica that reported on a um, bug that was found in a Python script that is widely used in some chemistry analysis. And uh, it says that you know, it's it, it may have affected hundreds of studies and papers that were published in chemistry and uh, found that the scripts return correct results on certain OS versions, but not on others, right? And after a lot of digging, they figured out that these scripts use the library that actually return um, results in different sorted order depending on the OS, right? So here, the level of abstractions of the libraries and OS actually uh, um, led to this interaction that impacted the results of uh, these particular experiments. Another example was published in PLOS One, where they uh, studied the effects of a, a particular software called uh, Free, Free Surfer that is used to um, measure anatomical volume and corpuscle uh, measurements. And what they found is that when they varied the software version OS and hardware, uh, they got different measurements, right? And again, that shows like dependencies that you thought would be isolated with the abstraction, but in this case, negatively impact the results, right? And there is this, you know, kind of like vertical complexity uh, in abstraction, but you can also have horizontal complexity. And this example is, you know, uh, motivated by a colleague of mine who's an astronomer. And uh, he, 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 we were talking about reproducibility and he said that he, the biggest problem that he has is that his research requires multiple workflows run at different places. So he, he has a, a place where they collect data from a telescope. Then the data is sent to an HPC facility to do some data preparation. Then the result of the prepared data is actually analyzed in the astronomer's uh, desktop. And finally, they come up with you know, this beautiful image. And the image is weird. And uh, is this a scientific discovery? Is that his next Nobel Prize? Or is this a bug, right? And in, in one particular case, the bug was actually in a, a data preparation step. Another time was when they got the information from the telescope it was, a, it was a different phase of the moon, so it overexposed the image and generated the weird uh, feature in the final result, right? But the problem is that this takes a long time to uh, uh, find out and debug, right? And the problem here is that, yes, computing environments are controlled, and, but they're very complex and they can hide interactions that affect your results uh, in a way that is invisible to you, right? Um, so, what this means is that uh, if you re when you run your computations, you actually need to capture provenance for these different layers of abstraction. You need to unpack these abstractions so that uh, you're able to identify these potential problems that can happen hidden in, uh, the, in, in this vertical as well as horizontal complexity, right? And when I talk about provenance, uh, I, what I mean is that this dependency graph, it's a graph that captures the dependencies between the environments, processes, and data that contribute uh, in, in your result, right? And what I, I think that, you know, was interesting to me is that, you know, yes, people think that, you know, reproducibility is easy, it, it happens in, um, um, in a controlled environment, but this controlled environment is very complex. And just in natural sciences, we need to be able to observe and uh, capture what happens uh, under the hood so that we can understand, you know, uh, um, how, if, if and how they actually impact the results, right? So this means that we need to capture provenance at these different levels. And let me just go over a few different kinds of provenance that uh, um, need to be captured. 
So the, the most straightforward one and one that most people already do is the capture of prospective provenance, right? So when you write a script, you build a workflow or you have a Jupyter notebook, you have a full description of the steps that you follow, right? And in some cases, if you have, uh, if you're doing that in the same laptop where you created that script, you are gonna be able to reproduce it, right? But in general, uh, this is not going to be sufficient for reproducibility. It gives you transparency in terms of what you did, but you may not be able to reproduce that. And let me give you a concrete example. We did this study where we got uh, 1.4 million notebooks uh, from GitHub. Um, and amongst those, uh, we were able to attempt executions for about a million. Uh, and when we executed them, only 25% executed without errors, uh, and only 4.57% returned the same results as uh, reported in the notebook, right? And uh, we found a number of problems, uh, but the main problems that contributed to these was the fact that uh, the dependencies were missing, right? Both to library versions, as well as to data that is used inside the, um, um, the scripts and the, the notebooks, right? So this is a well-known problem that people call dependency hell. And when you're actually doing your analysis or uh, you know when, when you're coding, uh, it's really difficult to find and track all the chains of dependencies for uh, your analysis, right? And if you try to share that with somebody, even if you provide the list, it's really difficult for the person to actually rebuild all the environment and put together all the dependencies to run your code uh, smoothly, right? The good news is that, yes, this happens in a computer and uh, we can automate this process. We can automatically gather all these dependencies. Um, and this is what the tool that we develop in my group called Reprozip does. Uh, it makes use, makes use of ptrace. So it sits in the operating system. So you start your analysis, you, you, you're running your analysis and the system is there listening and checking all the system calls, access to libraries, file reads, file writes. It analyzes all that information and generates like a, a, a bill, a list of everything that is needed and uses that to generate a package where it's gonna actually copy all the needed dependencies inside the package, right? Input files, output files, parameters, the programs, the several programs that might have been used, environment variables and so on. And once you have that, that package, you can actually unpack it anywhere, right? You can use virtualization, Docker containers, virtual machines, uh, and unpack that experiment with no work, with just a click of a button and rerun everything the same way that was um, executed in the author's machine, right? So here is a, a, an example where you actually, leverage retrospective provenance, the log of an execution to support portability and not only reproducibility, but also portability, the ability to run in different environments. Um, and here, the transparency that you attain is that not only you have the description of the computational environment, but you also have the dependencies, right? So ideally, if you have your program, uh, your Python script, and you now have all the dependencies, you have a higher level of transparency. Any questions so far? Okay. All right, so I talked about you know, capturing provenance for, in, let's say, static programs, scripts. But when you're doing data exploration, uh, uh, these, you know, so when you have the script and you have your dependencies, yes, you, you, you can have reproducibility. The issue is that when you're doing data exploration, you don't have just a single script, right? As I showed in that uh, graph, in, that, in a figure, you, you iterate, you start analyzing your data and this is a precipitation data. So you generate a, a histogram, you play your histogram, but now you want to look at the interplay between precipitation and temperature. So now instead of using a histogram, you do a scatter plot and you keep doing that, right? So you start with a computational process and you keep changing it as your you know, understanding of the problem and your you know, new questions arise, right? So it changes the norm. So it's actually in this try and error process, you need provenance, not just of the individual scripts, but how they evolve over time, right? Of all the actions that you performed uh, in, during the exploration problem. 
And this is key in order for you not only to reason about the steps followed, but to reproduce and, as we're going to talk later, debug these different steps. You know, um, find um, you know the the problems that I mentioned before. And uh, in this case, um, we again built the system called these trails. Uh, which did this provenance of exploration for a specific uh, type of systems, workflow systems, scientific workflow systems, right? And the basic idea there is that uh, you automatically and transparently track the actions that user perform um, when they're exploring data. So here you have, um, you know, a tree, and you can think about this as kind of like Git on steroids where you have you know, each node is gonna to correspond to one workflow and then the path or the edge between two nodes are like the changes from one workflow to the other one, right? So maybe I can, I don't know if I need to go over this very, I could, I could go it fast, right? So the idea here is that uh, you know, maybe you already have a history, you have a number of workflows that you created. Um, of course, with the history, you can reproduce what you had done before. So here, you know, you can add that and you can visualize the result of that particular workflow. That's the other workflow that you created. Uh, but now you can try to see, you know, uh, explore different uh, questions that you might have or might want to visualize that particular object in different ways, right? So you can go changing your workflow. And as you're doing that, uh, the system is automatically capturing all these different actions uh, that you're taking. Right, and in the end, and I can speed this up, right? Um, you're gonna see that now you have, you know, all the different versions and um, uh, capture there and you can compare them uh, side by side and see, um, you know, the, the real effect of the change, the changes, right? The before and the after, okay, all right? So behind the system, there's this notion of uh, change-based provenance, uh, which uh, is, this, uh, you know, the idea that when you have a, um, when you want to change, to track the evolution of our workflow, you need to treat this workflow as a first class data item and track how it changes over time. So the provenance here uh, corresponds to changes to computational tasks. In, in workflow systems, that means um, adding a module, a connection, changing a parameter value, right? And, um, you know, as a result, you have this, um, uh, what we call a V's trail, but essentially it's a version tree where the nodes correspond to a workflow and the edges, as I said, correspond to the sequence of actions that transform this workflow into uh, this particular workflow. Uh, and, uh, you know, in order to compute a workflow, you simply execute all the actions in the path from the root node, which is the empty workflow, to the leaf node. Right, so essentially you're composing these different actions. And what is nice about this model is that although it was inspired and originally designed for um, tracking changes to workflow systems, uh, you, it, on, on the underlying this model is an algebra whose actions could actually be um, instantiated based on specific semantics of different applications, right? So you saw how it does in these trails and it captures changes of workflows. And here's another example where we applied the same idea to Maya, which is a 3D uh, design uh, tool that is widely used in the gaming industry and in Hollywood to build these 3D objects, right? So the same model was used there, but now the actions correspond to actions that people perform in this tool, right? It's like, you know, drawing the squares, pro uh, protruding them and smoothing things and so on and so forth. Is this clear? Okay. Right, and uh, again, we use that for different tools, not just Maya, but you know, a number of other uh, tools that are available and open source tools also. So what are the, the uh, sorry, uh, advantages of, uh, or benefits of uh, this change-based provenance, right? So one is it's generally applicable to a number of different systems, as long as they have like some notion of undo redo, and that's how we did the, implemented this on uh, Maya. We just uh, hijack the undo redo stack of the system. And uh, another advantage is that it captures uh, both data provenance, the data produced by the experiment, and as well as the evolution of the computational processes at the same time, right? So you can, using this information, you, you can 
answer questions like where a particular data come from, how it was derived, as well as how the computations evolved over time. And this can allow you not only to reproduce the results, but you have full transparency of the exploration process. Now you have, uh, uh, you have uh, the, the trail of all your uh, trial and error uh, process, the successful as well as the failures, everything is well documented. And we also show that uh, having this information has a number of benefits that go beyond just reproducibility. So for example, it can uh, support reflective reasoning because now you have this guide and you know everywhere that you have been, you can very easily go back, try different things, modify your processes and not get lost and not get to the end and not know how you got there. You always have your map. Uh, now it's really easy to compare data products. Not only that, you can compare the products and now you can actually see the changes in the processes that cause the differences in the data products, right? Uh, and there's a bunch of other things that maybe I, I'll just keep, uh, you know, it, it helps knowledge reuse. Uh, a very nice application also that uh, we um, had for this information is this ability of uh, providing recommendations. Once you have the history for many people using the system and building these workflows, uh, you can actually use, mine that information and provide this uh, uh, recommendations. Very much like when you type in a URL and it completes for you, you can start building your workflows and we can use the information from you know, prior um, explorations to um, provide recommendations for full completion. So you read a data set and they can say, so these are the different kinds of visualizations that you can generate, right? And uh, what is interesting is that Vistrails maybe in many ways was very early in its time because we started doing Vistrails, it was like 2003. Right, so a lot of these ideas uh, are also applied, uh, uh, applicable to data science pipelines today. And, uh, and as we've seen, there's a number of uh, workflow-like systems right now right, for building machine learning pipelines. Uh, you have Spark, you have a number of data flow-based systems that are widely used in data science pipelines where you know, these ideas could uh, actually be applied. All right, so I need to run, I'm almost out of time. So let's uh, try to move to, 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 to trust, right? So, so you need provenance because, you know, just like in science, you need to be able to observe your environment, right? But to build trust, what you do in science is that once you observe, you design um, experiments to test uh, and to test your hypothesis, right? So reproducibility, in, it's, it's not really your end goal. Your end goal is to build trust and use reproducibility as a means to enable you to automatically run these replicability studies to figure out you know, how to test if you vary parts of your experiment, uh, how that actually affects the final result, right? So, uh, so I, I already mentioned this example, right? You get a result is what you have, um, a discovery or a bug. And this is something that happens uh, you know, everywhere. I've been talking to some people uh, in industry and what I've been told is that uh, you know, finding bugs in long chains of workflows is a big bottleneck for them that they spent a lot of time and a lot of money doing, right? Uh, and if you just look at, you know, this is a figure uh, that tries to depict the big data ecosystem. Uh, and you can see that you know, in enterprises, they have, uh, workflows that run over all these different, you know, from data sources, systems for ingestion, uh, systems for data processing and so on. And when anything breaks, they have to actually um, uh, unpack all of these to try and find the sources of it, right? And the question is, uh, you know, can we do better? Um, and uh, the answer is that maybe, right? Uh, if we actually have this, provenance information, we can try to compare and contrast different runs with different conditions uh, and uh, try to identify amongst those conditions what actually co uh, corresponds to the root cause for uh, the problem, right? And provenance helps you up to a certain point, but uh, it, it, it is necessarily incomplete. So let me give you an example. Uh, so here's a, um, 
template for a machine learning pipeline that reads uh, some data set, split into train and test, applies an estimator, and then computes, say, the F measure score and outputs that, right? And uh, we ran this for different, uh, and that's, you know, the, the people, some, somebody trying to design a good pipeline for a given problem. And here, the, the, the pipeline was run um, for different combinations of uh, parameters for different data sets. Uh, using different estimators, different library versions for that estimators, and here's the, the result that it got, right? And in this case, we define the failure or un undesirable behavior of the pipeline when it has very low F measure score, right? So in this case, we have um, two instances that actually failed. And if you look at the data long enough, you can actually see that uh, oh, uh, what is in common between these two uh, failing instances? Uh, both of them use gradient boosting, right? So I can actually have my hypothesis that gradient boosting is uh, uh, contributing to the failure of uh, you know, these two instances. But is it the case that that's really the cause, right? Uh, and the provenance uh, is not sufficient to assess that, but if I'm able to reproduce this pipeline with different values, I can try different combinations. And for example, I can try, you know, I maintain uh, this CP3 and I change a very one thing, just like in the scientific process, right? And in this case, I change the library version and boom, the system actually, the, the workflow actually succeeds, right? So the idea here is that, you know, you can execute new configurations to test uh, your hypothesis, as well as formulate new ones. The challenge, though, is how do you select these different configurations, right? Um, and as you can imagine, these workflows and workflows that have lots of parameters, lots of values for those parameters, you can run into a combinatorial explosion in things that you want to try, right? So uh, we developed a system called BugDoc uh, that uh, provides different approaches to debugging this pipeline. So it assumes that uh, um, parts of the, that the components of these workflows are black boxes. Um, and the model that it defines is one where you can use abstraction to selectively expose the components of the pipeline that you want to um, observe and modify, right? So in this case, in our example, we can say that we want to expose the data set. Uh, we can expose the um, uh, percentage of uh, train and task split, like 67%, 50%. Um, and you can also do higher order kinds of, uh, you know, have higher order kind of, kind of parameters. In this case, I can have my estimator be, uh, you know, a range over different methods, right? And the other part of the model is a, an evaluation function that actually defines what is success and failure, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, one of the key things behind BugDoc is that it just does leverage this ability to reproduce to create new instances, right? Uh, and I won't have time, but we have defined a couple of algorithms that uh, are efficient to uh, find the root causes, does this exploration. Uh, so the shortcut is actually we can prove that uh, it can find explanations in time linear with the number of parameters. We have another one that is more complex, but uh, derives more complex explanations for the root causes of fa uh, failure. And uh, in our paper, if you want to get more details, we show that uh, it actually attains very high precision and recall with respect to the root causes it finds compared to ad other systems that also derive uh, explanations for pipelines. Right? Um, we also uh, started to talk with a big software company and that it was a very interesting experience in that uh, we went there, uh, we actually had a um, um, use case, we deployed BugDoc in their uh, environment. And what is nice is that because all these companies use this big data stack, they already have reproducibility and they already have uh, the ability to run everything in a containerized uh, way. So integrating the system was actually not too hard. And uh, the system found a number of problematic configurations, uh, both in computation scripts and input data files, right? And it also uncovered some other issues that uh, we actually didn't uh, deal with before and that we are collaborating with them on addressing, right? All right, so I'm out of time, so I'm gonna conclude. 
so um, so I, I hope that I convey to you that uh, you know when you're trying to empower domain experts, um, we need a number of um, um, ingredients, right? So we, we need usability, but we also need scalability to uh, support interactivity. Uh, and more importantly, and an area that I think there's a lot more work needed is how to assess the quality of your results as well as debug the process that you um, followed to um, derive those results, right? And it's been my experience that uh, whenever you have interdisciplinary teams and closely collaborate with um, data experts, that's the only way that you actually are able to really solve an end-to-end -end problem, right? So as I, I, mean, I, I showed to you, I um, mean, a number of our projects uh, by combining visualization, computer graphics, HCI, and data management, we're able to come up with solutions and build systems that were actually adopted by these um, um, domain experts. And what I've seen also is that, uh, you know, it's not very often, very often that it happens, but it, sometimes it happens that we get this virtual cycle where you start trying to solve a domain expert's problem, you, you find an interesting computer science problem that solves their problem and you keep doing that and you know that's a very good place to be right it's, it's making uh, contributions to computer science as well as to domain and have one drive the other right so i think another important message is that uh, you know oftentimes when people talk about large data they say oh use a cluster use expensive hardware and the one thing that we uh, we saw in our research is that uh, you can actually get very high good scalability even on desktops and laptops and by focusing you know efforts on that end you know we can actually cater to the long tail of science and users that don't have access uh, to big clusters okay. um, so in terms of uh, provenance and reproducibility uh, you know, i see them as key uh, and uh, requirements to build trust and um, in results and explain the results uh, produced by computational processes, right? Um, uh, there's been a lot of work and a lot of attention given to the problem of explaining machine learning, machine learning models. But machine learning is just one piece, one part of the data science pipeline, right? So I think that there's a lot more work that is needed to think about, and, thinking about this problem in a more holistic way, you need to consider the data preparation, the data ingestion, uh, value imputation, and uh, all the other steps that actually contribute to the result, including the vertical complexity that I talk about, right? Because you can get a result and because of the wrong operating system, the result is actually invalid, right? So um, we, we need to be able to explain computations and we also need, uh, oh, and one interesting uh, future direction is that, you know, we looked at uh, this debugging um, for failures, for uh, um, unexpected behaviors in, in pipeline. But um, I think that similar techniques can also be applicable to uh, assess fairness and biases, right? And like essentially seeing this assessment as finding one bug, and the bug here is the bias in, in your algorithm. Um, and so, although provenance and reproducibility uh, are, are, are key, right, uh, it's nowadays, you know, more, uh, not everybody actually works uh, in a reproducible way or follow, uh, follows reproducibility best practices. And this is one of the findings that we had on this um, National Academy's um, study group that I participated in, right? Um, but there, there are um, positive signs in the sense that there has been substantial progress in tools and infrastructure for reproducibility, in particular, all this you know, big data ecosystem that is out there, right? And tools that are actually um, uh, specifically designed to support reproducibility. The challenge here is that there's still many gaps um, in terms of, uh, you know, unpacking these all these different abstraction layers, right, and capturing provenance at the different um, um, uh, levels. And um, one of the recommendations that we had in our report is that we need to invest in filling these gaps. Um, and the, my big 
dream, I would say, is that uh, you know, when we fill these gaps, we can actually have provenance capture uh, and reproducibility be standard components of our computing environments. And we don't need, essentially we do whatever we're doing right now and we get all the provenance and reproducibility for free. All right, so this is uh, my dream and I'll close with that. I have to thank a number of collaborators, big group, great people. Thank you so much and sorry for running over. Okay. Um, by the way, so these are like the, I, every place that I go, I add and give a talk, I add the, the local language. So these are places, languages for places that I've uh, given talks at. Juliana? Excuse me, gosh. Uh, do you have a moment for a few questions? Sure, I do. Okay. So anyone in the audience, um, raise your hand. I'll try to find you. Uh, if you have a question you'd like to ask, I'll run the microphone to you. But while I look for those hands, I will ask one of our virtual questions that we had come through. Um, so Irene Morse asks, um, you've created some really cool ways to improve reproducibility, but I feel like replicability is the bigger issue. She says she's a social scientist, so we have a crisis here. Um, do you have any ideas about how to push scientists to create more reproducible work? For example, I'm wondering if these workflow trees could automatically suggest robustness checks or could propose alternative paths that may produce very different results. Right, so, so I agree that replicability is, uh, is harder, but reproducibility for computation experiments is a requirement. You cannot have replication without reproducibility. And I agree, you know, and this is a direction that I'm pushing and that I'm working on now is uh, how do we help build trust? Essentially, can we come up with analysis that flag people potential problems and, you know, maybe recommend solutions to that? And I think that provenance has uh, a big role to play there, not only by observing all the variables that you might need to change when you do your, your automated replication um, uh, studies, but also to save um, information about what happened in the past so that you can make these recommendations, right? And that is something that in machine learning, uh, we are already doing, right? There's this whole idea of meta learning. So I've been working on this um, um, AutoML system. And, you know, these systems automatically search huge spaces for pipelines that solve particular machine learning problems, right? And after some time, we actually, I forget how many executions we have, right? But now that we have all that data, uh, we actually use that, we mine that information to generate a grammar that guides our AutoML system. So essentially we are using the output of the system to make the system better. And I think that that is something that the, if people start doing, you know, working in a participant way and sharing their results, that's something that can help push science forward uh, as the, I, I didn't get the name of the person. Irene, yes that Irene mentioned. Yeah. And then could you move back one slide, please? We have someone asking for that. This one? Yeah, I think so. Okay. One, one question that often comes up with provenance systems is the overhead that it imposes. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think, I mean, it, there's some things that are, that are absolutely necessary irrespective of the price. So that having been said, how do you think about the cost of managing provenance and in terms of adequate provenance, what kind of overhead or extra cost should people be expected to pay? Right, so, so I think it all depends on the application. In some cases, you won't be able to capture everything all the time because it's just going to be very expensive. So if you're running production workflows at a big software company, you know, that it's like uh, that people are interacting with the results and so on, maybe you cannot afford to have a, a large overhead for provenance capture. But then when a problem occurs, maybe you turn the provenance on so that you can try to figure that out, right? Uh, in other cases, like for example, provenance of data exploration. That, you know, if you think about these trails, the overhead there is tiny because the overhead of the provenance is much smaller than the amount of data that is actually collected, right? Um, another case that is difficult is like fine grain provenance. That can add a lot of overhead, 
right? If you have to keep like um, um, several versions of uh, you know data sets, that can be expensive. So I think that the answer is, is, is it depends on the specific, and that's where I, I, I said that there are lots of gaps because maybe there are some good solutions for certain scenarios, but not for others. And the big challenge that I see before us is, you know, can we take a holistic view of the problem, identify these gaps, and design an ecosystem where you can mix and match these different pieces so that we can cater to these different scenarios, right? But there's a both, I think, research and, and, and engineering required to come up with a solution for this. Thank you very much. Thank you.